Good morning and welcome to Ireland AM and Virgin Media One. We've got plenty to come over the next three hours. We have a mad, mad show today. It's a lot, yeah. Coming up, should you post pictures of your children online? We'd love to hear from you on this one because obviously we're all living there online now. We'll be speaking to Irish journalist Anne-Marie O'Sullivan about why she removed all of her children's photos from her social media accounts. De listen, it's something that's debated in our house as well, you know, whether you post your children's pictures. Because once they're out there, that's them. They can be used in the newspapers. It can be used by anybody, which is quite frightening. So, yeah, yeah it is. It's going to be a really interesting. Looking forward to that mm -hmm. one. Also looking forward to this one. We're going to be talking to a mum mm -hmm. who claims, claims, she has potty trained her eight-month old son. I'm going to say no chance. But it's all part of the no nappy movement. We're going to be finding out how she did it after nine. But is that just, OK, I've potty trained my child, but you're running around after them like I, this, I going, trying to grab my it. My son is three at the minute, and I was cleaning poo out of his pants last <laughs> night. So, I mean, if you could do it in eight months, well done. I want to know how you did it. The glamorous life of Tommy Bow, mm. everybody. Now it's over to Alan. Dab had a change in the nappies, aren't uh, you, Yeah, Alan? totally love it. Lo love, love it. it. Yeah. Will you head up to the Bow household now? Yeah. Oh, help do some help, please. Yeah. Yeah. Go around after the three-year-old. No. Yeah. Well, well, your eyes... he's, he's almost three. He's almost three. Your eyes actually yeah. glazed over there. You're like, you're running around after a three. I'm all right, yeah, thanks. I'm all right there yeah. now. Yeah. Now, you're going to have to... Uh, we're, we're going to have to wait. Oh, no. <laughs> anyway, go on. <laughs> Are you here? You remember you're back to work. You're no, not in Panto. Do you see, our producer, Gordon, had written in some clever little ad lib for me to say there, but it wasn't clever enough. Uh, sorry, Gordon. <laughs> also on the show this morning, our TikTok talk will be here to answer any of your health-related questions. So if you have a query for Dr. Monica, get them in to us on 089 611 Now, Derek is live in Leitrim this morning. Derek, what delights has Leitrim got to offer us today? Leitrim's got loads to offer, including traffic lights. They're the first traffic light here in the county. Anyway, good morning from lovely Leitrim. We're live here right across the morning. Now it's another wet, another windy start out there this morning. Plenty of blustery and thundery showers to take us right across the day. But we've come down here to Carrick on Shannon because we're off to meet Leitrim hurler Zach Moradi, originally from Iraq. So the plan is to get a boat out on the Shannon, have a chat with Zach, and also have a little bit of a hurling challenge. But guys, it's our first time ever broadcasting from Leitrim. Come on. Are you with us? Lovely Leitrim. Here we go. <laughs> the Wild Rose County. Lovely Leitrim. It's, it's De so Derek's planning on making it to all, I think, 32 counties yeah, he's pretty in, much in a year. A he's doing pretty good. Well. This is 25 now. OK, you can stop with the music, Derek. Can we get him a proper boombox like from the 80s Pearls. rather than just the phone? Zach Moradi having to hurl on a boat. It'd be interesting how that goes. Anyway, Sounds like is... a good hen party. Carrick and Shannon, right I bet you that's the thing, yeah. Time to go get the news now, though, with Anne O'Donnell. Thanks, Tommy. Good morning. Well, the Taoiseach Leo Varadkar is travelling to Belfast today where he'll meet with leaders of all the main political parties and the Northern Ireland Brexit Business Working Group. Well, the meeting is aimed at making progress on the protocol and restoration of the North's executive. Meanwhile, Thánaiste Michal Martin is meeting with the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland before travelling to Armagh for a number of engagements. Well, the Taoiseach has said no decision has been made by government on whether to extend the eviction ban, which expires at the end of March. It comes as a record number of 11,542 homeless people are in need of emergency accommodation. That was back in November. The number of people in emergency accommodation is increasing and that remains a real worry. Um, it is important to say that um, uh, when people hear the term uh, over over 11,000 people being homeless, um, some people believe that means living on the streets or living in tents. That's not the case. These are all people who are being provided with emergency accommodation uh, by the state. Um, it's just that they don't have a secure tenancy, and I think it's important to bear that in mind. Michael Flatley's team has said that the American Irish dancer has undergone surgery for an aggressive form of cancer. Well, they released a statement last night on his social media channels asking for prayers for the Lord of the Dance star, who is now, they say, in the care of doctors. Well, it's unclear if this aggressive form of cancer is linked to skin cancer that Flatley confirmed he had been treated for back in 2003. 
Well, today marks the first anniversary of the death of Ashling Murphy. The 23-year-old teacher was killed while she was out for a run near her home in Tullamore in County Offaly. Ashling Murphy was out jogging along the bank of the Grand Canal in Tullamore on the afternoon of January 12th last year when her life was cut short. A talented traditional musician, the 23-year-old was working as a teacher at Duro National School when she was killed. Her death led to public outrage with the whole country mourning her loss. Today, an anniversary mass in her local parish will mark one year since her death, while a memorial fund has been set up in her name. Trish Laverty, Virgin Media News. Well, in other news, Virgin Media Television is today launching its spring schedule with brand new Irish shows. New programmes which include How to Buy a Home, which follows the ups and downs of people trying to purchase a property in Ireland, while stories from the street following the lives of homeless people in the capital will also go to air. Well, two seasons of Love Island is back as well, with the first one kicking off on Monday. The Guinness Six Nations Rugby Championship lands back on our screens as well in February. The White House Press Secretary has faced a series of testy exchanges over the discovery of classified documents in one of the US President Joe Biden's former offices. Well, Biden had said during the week that he was surprised to be informed following this discovery of the government records. And Biden said his attorneys did what they should have done when they immediately called the National Archives. He kept an office there after he left the vice presidency in 2017. Again, I'm not going to get into the details. I'm not going to get beyond what the president shared yesterday. He laid out what he knew, when he knew it. Uh, he laid out uh, how important it is. He sees it, seriously, it very seriously uh, when it comes to taking classified documents and information. Uh, I'm just not going to. I know you all are going to have a lot of questions on this, uh, but at this time, I'm not going to go beyond uh, what the president said yesterday. I'm not going to go beyond what my colleagues from the White House Council uh, shared uh, with many of you. And finally for now, guitarist Jeff Beck has died at the age of 78. Representatives for the musicians say he died after suddenly contracting bacterial meningitis. Beck first came to prominence as a member of the Yardbirds and then went out on his own in a solo career. For car insurance, van insurance or home insurance, call the quote devil. Unless, of course, you've got money to burn. Thank you, Chair, and a very good morning to you at home or if you're indeed uh, streaming online on the player. We're coming to you live here from Carrick on Shannon. First time broadcasting from the county. Coming up later on, we're going to be catching up with Leitrim hurler Zach Moradi. Hopefully, we're going to get a boat out in the Shannon as well. Weather dependent, of course, but that's all to come live here from lovely Leitrim right across the morning. Anyway, let's take an opening look at weather together now with Martin Rigney on cameras with us this Thursday. And it is another wet and another windy start out there this morning. We have that band of showers now hitting parts of Donegal, just clipping Leitrim and Sligo at the moment, passing down through Cavan into we uh, Meath and County Westmeath through Delvin and Castle Pollard. And in fact, parts of East County Galway uh, through Athenry not escaping either in those fresh to strong, locally gusty westerly winds. Now, right across the day, a real seesaw weather day in store in terms of that rain because we're going to see plenty of passing showers across the country. Now, we will see some bright spells for a time quite limited though in nature out there today with an ongoing risk of hail and thunderstorm activity mainly confined into parts of Ulster and another chilly day out there today. Top temps in and around 7 to 8 degrees so wrap up nice and toasty if you're heading out and about. Finally then tonight that rain though showers persisting across the country and again very very blustery with those westerly winds in the driving seat to take us through tonight into tomorrow morning but we promise you a little bit of taste or finally a return to sunshine on the cars for Friday with values back to about 2 to 7 degrees. So that's how it's shaping up here in a blustery Carrigan Shannon in County Leitrim at the moment. We'll be back again live at 7.35. For first time drivers, young drivers, returning drivers, if you've had an open claim or have had too many penalty points. The quote devil's always got one hell of a quote. Now coming up, Gardaí are to monitor anti-asylum anti seeker protests which are planned at nine different locations today. We're going to have that story and lots, lots more coming up after this short break. See you shortly.
Welcome back. Time now to look at this morning's papers. We'll start with the Irish Times. It's headline. Varadkar warns there may not be room for all refugees. There are growing fears in government that accommodation options are running out as the number of Ukrainian arrivals is expected to increase and hotels will seek to take back rooms currently occupied by refugees for the tourist season. Patients wait 24 hours for bed in 17 hospitals. That's the front page of the Irish Independent. Patients were waiting 24 hours for a bed in 17 hospitals yesterday as the winter surge in emergency care continues to take its toll. The examiner leads with protests at asylum centres cross line of decency. Protests outside asylum seeker accommodation cross the line of decency, Tonishta Michal Martin has said. His remarks come ahead of several protests planned for today at facilities housing asylum seekers. Too many first-time mothers are having C-sections is the top story on the Daily Mail. Too many first-time mothers are being persuaded to have caesarean sections due to doctors' fears of litigation and out of convenience. That's a major study has found. The star goes as Flatley battles cancer. The Lord of the Dance, Michael Flatley, has had surgery for an aggressive form of cancer. A statement posted to the dancer's social media accounts last night has revealed. The Mayor leads with that same story, Flatley cancer battle. And finally, the Herald's front page, he's milking it. A judge has described as extraordinary the state paying disability benefit for a Limerick burglary gang member. And why is he getting this disability? He's lactose intolerant. <laughs> That's the front page of the Herald. It should and be. The I mean, more who I read. signs off for that? Hi, Andrea Gilligan is here from News Talk. Hello, how Sorry, are you didn't doing? Sign off on us. <laughs> you didn't sign off on us. Sorry, we're just, I've gone through citizens' advice. I'm on citizens.ie this morning going, how do you just, is everyone entitled to disability if they're lactose, lactose intolerant? Lactose intolerance. Yeah, I suppose you can probably probably make a case for it. Um, I would like to think you have to prove that, you know, you suffer from a but lactose if, intolerance, but I mean... But there's lots of people who suffer from lactose yeah, intolerance and to be getting the government and the, the public to be paying for As it. A, I mean, what even is it? Do you not just like have to cut out on... Like milk, it's, yeah. Yeah, it's a digestive issue, isn't it? It's to do with your um, and it's very, the sugar that you consume yeah. within the And I'm not dairy saying that it's or, not serious, yeah. but I think it gets everyone's backs up well, when you're thinking about carers in this country who don't have hot running water in their houses to mind their children because they don't get any sort of a benefit that covers the cost of living. And a fella who's a member of a burglary gang that did an awful burglary in 2018, only getting sentenced now, is getting disability benefit for being well, lactose as, intolerant. As you read the comments from Judge Garvin himself there, I mean, it's, it would seem absolutely extraordinary that somebody would be in receipt of a social welfare payment um, for yeah, lactose intolerance. But I'm sure the public will have views on that today. It's just, insane, yeah. Let us know what you think on that. 0896 one. I couldn't believe it. Yeah, absolutely. Anyway, let's move on to... Another, um, listen, it's one year since Ashton Murphy's murder. We saw scenes in the in the news just a minute ago about the vigil being held in her local town, village. Desperately sad. Yeah, oh, look, it's... I think, you know, the death of Ashton Murphy um, this time last year was really seen as a kind of a watershed moment in Irish society. And there was a lot of discussion when you cast your mind back, like, at the time to women's safety. How, how safe do people men and women feel in this country and, and what can be done to, to stop the um, issues around gender-based violence. And we've had the kind of chorus of calls from government calling for change. We've had a lot of sort of community groups, people, you know, um, coming together, protesting, rallying and calling for some form of action. But when you actually look at what has changed or has there been any change in the last 12 months, uh, we've had this um, this third national strategy that was announced. It was about 360 odd million and it was basically, basically going to see money, um, extra additional funds pumped into the likes of improving support services for victims of gender-based violence, extra services and accommodation provided at um, refuges as well. But that's going to be something that I suppose is implemented, you know, over a long term period. We're also, we've been promised as well from uh, Justice Minister Helen McEntee that from next January, there'll also be this kind of statutory agency against domestic and gender based violence as well. And Sorry, that's one that element next January? that's of January so that's to come into place, away. yeah, from 2024. But the reality of all this, Tommy, is like you can, you can look and talk about all these plans and committees and strategies that are going to be implemented. Like, on Lunchtime Live in the show, for instance, this week, we just talked to, to people, to women, 
about how safe do you feel? And the reality of this is that women have still stopped going for runs in the dark, you know, after mm -hmm. four o'clock in the afternoon because, you know, they're fearful for their, for their safety. I spoke to one lady on the show this week who actually stopped running in, in the Phoenix Park and, you know, set up a gym membership to bring her up to the, the spring months of, of late March. Mm. Um, I talked to people this week who still, you know, when they're walking home at night after work, this is only at six and seven in the evening, mm. um, walking with a bunch of keys in their hand. And I know myself, like, it's only when you stop and you think of the kind of things that you do or the measures. Like, I'd often, if I ever felt in a bit of an uncomfortable situation or saw a group of people up ahead of me and didn't feel comfortable, I, I, I know myself, I've often kind of pretended I was nearly on the mm. phone or said, oh, yeah, I can see you up ahead. I'll, I'll be there, I'll be back home in two minutes. Or, And they're the kind of things that when you look at this, and on the face of it, as I said, yes, we've strategies, we've all this kind of stuff, but has actually anything really changed? Well, well obviously, not obviously not. What it's dealing with, like, either way, Bruna Fonseca was murdered in her own apartment by her ex-boyfriend. There's nothing that she can do in that situation. There's an anger inside this world towards people who are spurned. Jennifer Poole last year, she was murdered by her partner, who'd also been in jail before. Uh, he said he was on holiday and he'd been in jail and... Um, he was, he was, uh, he was, he'd been given a sentence for what he'd done to a previous partner. We've got Natalie McNally was murdered 15 weeks pregnant in Lurgan over Christmas. It's, I know we sit there and we're like, what can we do when we put money into this? But there is an anger there. And, you know, if a woman's backed into a corner and there's a fella there and he wants to hurt you, he's going to hurt you. And it's very hard. Something about that. Yeah, it's very hard to see the tangible change. Um, and like, you know, you, you've talked about some of the people there, like despite all of the discourse, the discussion, the conversation that we had on, on, on this programme and, and many others, you know, over the last 12 months. Last year, 2022, was the worst year in a decade mm. for violence against women. Like, there were 12 women in total um, who died in, in instances like this. And, and that is the reality of it. Yeah. You know, so it's very hard to, I think, qualify what is tangible change. But what I do know, as I said, from just talking to people this week, is that really a lot of those kind of additional safety measures that, that we do, that you shouldn't have to do, but that you do do, they still take place, you know, yeah. in the it last just, uh, What boggles, like, is exactly, there was a huge, uh, I think, outcry and conversation mm. had after Ashley's murder last year. And then to see that last year was the worst year in a decade, with 11 or 12 murders, it's shocking. And I just, I, I think it's just insane with the government helm actually saying there's a zero tolerance but you what know, is that? What is yeah. that? What is it? You know, like, and if 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 they're not coming down hard and making a statement with things that are happening, uh, you know, I just I just don't think we'll it, see where things are going to stop. And it's increased violence. Like we were looking at assault figures last year. It's not good. Like it's what is going on in this world. It's, people can't feel safe in their own country. Like it's it's frightening. It really it, is. It's, it's just with ashing friends and family. Like yeah. this is know, every day, off, every friend, day is a life sentence you're, for them yeah, either yeah. way. So your that's heart just would absolutely is. break for yeah. for all of the family and friends today and colleagues. And as I said, I know the anniversary mass is vigil as well taking place yeah. today. And you know we are certainly thinking of. Absolutely. Uh, but we're also going on to another, another situation story, where yeah. it's this anger, this overflowing anger, where it's, we're going to look at this marginalised group of people. We're not going to look at the actual people who are causing us issues, you know, the 1% who are taking everything and da da da, da. We're going to blame asylum seekers because there's nine protests planned today yeah. for people who are fleeing war. Majority of which were in Dublin, two in County Kildare. And, and like we've, we've watched... Um, Various different protests take place over the last, I'd say, nearly at this stage, two, two and a half months uh, in various different parts of the country. Um, and now what's happening today is that there's going to be, there's a special policing plan actually in place. Some uniformed guards are going to be there at these protests, public order units on standby as well in the event that, you know, violence or something were to, to break out or were to happen. But, like, this is becoming a much more... Um, a much more, you know, common discussion. They're happening now on a, on a weekly basis in parts of in parts of Ireland, mm -hmm. um, and you know, it's 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 hard to know how you stop this because I suppose what can you know maybe government do when when you have a protest that's taking place? I heard Simon Harris, the, um, the the interim justice minister, talking about the fact that you know he feels people are um, travelling the country attending some of these protests, basically as well. You know, so like this is kind of part of. Like it's, read, it's, between, it's, read between the lines, what's going on there? Yeah, but uh, listen, you're traveling it's, the country, but and it's very spotted. listen. And it is, it's, a, it is, the, as they say, a right wing group who are trying to stir up discontent. But it is very important that the government try and lead on this because I, th I was reading there that the mayor of Kerry, John Flynn, said the welcome at the start of the war, it's not there today. 
Like, this is actually the mayor of Kerry came yeah. out and said that. So if these right-wing movements and people are kind of stirring up discontent in certain areas of the country, it's so important that the likes of Leo Bradker comes out and tries to keep the public on course with this. He's also come out yesterday and said that we're not going to be in a position to, to um, offer accommodation to every, every refugee who comes to Ireland. And I think we're going to have a big discussion about this in the next coming weeks because a lot of the contracts with the, um, yeah. the hotels that have been providing accommodation to about 80% mm -hmm. of the 70,000 odd Ukrainian refugees that are here at the moment, a lot of those contracts are going to be ending now in the next two, three months. And a lot of those hotel owners and providers are going to want to take those hotels back in hand because yeah. they're right into the tourist season. Yeah. So where does that now leave yeah. the state come, you know, two, three months' time? Like 70,000 Ukrainian refugees. It's an incredible. It's but a it's, huge amount of people, yeah. It's really interesting. A person I know, uh, her partner gets his news purely from TikTok and he was thinking about going to one of these and she was sitting there going, what are you talking about? And she sat down and, she, and he was like, oh, right, okay. Because, you know, she felt he was being brainwashed like about what was going on with this, you know, with this anti... Uh, anti-asylum seeker. But um, there are there are areas on. in the country where they feel that their towns and villages are now they've just been people have just been placed but into them. You do and, have a lot of seaside do, to, I mean, yeah. a lot of the seaside towns for which there were naturally a lot more accommodation available. Um, a lot Absolutely. of those towns. I mean, it's not been brainwashed. Like this is a real situation. No, no, in no, areas no, 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 no I'm not saying that. I'm saying how he got angry for some reason. It was yeah, he heard something course, that there was. Media, he heard that there was. They were going around and they were out. They were robbing chamber, places, course and that is, wasn't yeah. happening. She was like, "Okay, this didn't happen." Listen, let but us know. You know, there are people watching from all over the country at the minute. You know, what are your thoughts on this? When you have Leo Radker saying that there's not going to be room, there may not be room for more refugees going into the summer once with these hotels. Yeah, what are we going to do? 0896 111 We'd love to hear from you. Yeah, they're on that. not. They're not the problem in with relation to all of our problems with overcrowding in hospitals. With, um, well, with, it, I mean, with, it's with still the health service and schools. Yeah, but it's not a few thousand people from other countries that are causing these issues. We have got other issues, and a lot of it is being directed. Huge, 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 huge amount of issues. You know, it's it's very easy. This, in the last few weeks, huge the health service of issues. Yeah, this has happened for hundreds of years. This is the person who's causing the problems in your life, and it's not that person. Anyway, if we're going to move on to something completely and utterly different. Completely different. And this is Anorak of the Year Award. What are these, Andrea? How do you feel about your bins? Do you ever eye up your bin? They're Do I ever what? Do, do I ever eye up my bin? There's people who can power yeah. hose my bin. Well, there's bins actually a guy in the UK that. who does this. What do you mean? Uh, there's the, they're called the Dull Awards. Um, yeah. it's for the per and this particular man is um, obsessed with his, with his rubbish bin and other rubbish bins. So much so that he travels parts of the UK <laughs> to um, just have a look. This, this people's rubbish bins. Dustbin you know, Dave. Yeah, Dustbin Dave. Take a look at them. Can um, I just say, after talking about see people you know, putting them? racist protests, this is lovely. I love Dustbin Dave. Dull Dave, yeah. He just Dull goes Dave. around taking pictures of bins. I also love, though, that the oh, racist... Oh, in a bin! <laughs> <laughs> like, of all the things in the world that you could be obsessed with, why on earth would you pick a rubbish bin? Okay. That's the little bit I have around. The, the perfect outdoor bin. It has a big opening and a medium size. <laughs> you don't want it massive, you know? <laughs> I do like those little uh, rubbish bin um, holders. You know, like the little kind of little. There's like little, I don't know, wooden things you can. Oh put yes, that makes them look nice. Look really neat. Lovely. And they're nice lovely. And, oh, she's eyeing one up for her garden. Yeah, there you I'm go. Just, when I was younger, <laughs> I used like in school, I'd collect pencils that were down to the nub. Like if any of my mates were finished, I'd collect them and put them in a pencil case. So it was a really boring thing. You still have them. I'm sure there's a pencil case at home with just a pile of really tiny pencils. Everyone has a really dull thing that they've had in their life that you've been obsessed with. Maybe it's bins. I, 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 Maybe I it's think beyond the age of 10, Marie, no, I didn't have no. that. Work. Maybe it's know. washing machines. Maybe it's washing machines. Maybe people are into pistons. I don't know. Can you pistons. let us know if there's something? Can I? 0896 111 yeah. Something that you're just really into or your partner is. Can out. I just tell you about the, this, the, the award that he's been recognised with um, from the Dull Man's Club? There's actually a club in the UK. Sorry, can we talk about this? The Dull Man's Club, they have a 10,000 strong online membership. <laughs> I want to know who are the 10,000 people that are part what of this club. What a lovely thing to do online. And Andrea Gilligan from News Talk, the thank you so collect much. milk bottles and follow Brown Tour <laughs> For sign. joining us <laughs> Love this it. morning. Uh, get in touch. It's great to have you back. Now, when it comes to sharing children's photos online, there are a lot of unforeseen consequences that parents need to consider, joining, including myself. Yeah, absolutely. It's interesting. Uh, yeah. Joining us to discuss is journalist Amory O'Sullivan and tech expert Elaine Burke. Thank you both so much for being with us this morning. So, Amory, you decided to remove all of your children's photos online. Why did you do that? 
Well, I was scrolling away on Instagram and I came across a post with just one word which said violated. And so I kind of was curious. I clicked into it. And behind that was um, a parenting influencer, Katie Rose Pritchard. And all of the, her pictures of her children were put up on a fake account. Her children were given new names and new identities and new little stories about them, things they enjoyed, things they liked. And the four-year-old was given her own separate account and there was kind of underneath the captions of the pictures were things like DM me to become my friend and these kind of encouraging contact um, with the person who was posing as her child. So it just really unnerved me. I just thought it was very creepy um, and just not something that I had ever considered. You know, I was vaguely aware that maybe it's not a great idea to post pictures of your kids, but I never thought of specifics. And I suppose seeing this person and kind of feeling a bit of re the same reaction that she had of that kind of ick feeling. Mm. It just prompted me to kind of start deleting, going, why am I doing it? They don't need to be there. I don't have to have them. And there's a risk that I don't need to take. And it's a topic that's come up in our house mm. a lot, talking to my wife. She's not comfortable with it mm. and has her reasons. I'm a little bit like that. Can I just ask you as well, once, the, once you put a picture on social media, that's it gone, whether your account is private even or not. It, like, it's public property then, is that right? Well, essentially, yeah, you've kind of, you've uploaded it to a cloud server that is essentially owned by the platform that runs uh, those servers. Now, you can, uh, because of GDPR and stuff like that, you can submit a data subject access request and that can give you access all the data that a company holds on you, but also you can ask for complete removal of your data. So you mm. can go through processes to completely take down all that stuff. Uh, and you can use your GDPR knowledge to do all of that. But Our once it's out GDPR there- Our lack of GDPR knowledge, okay. Once it's, yeah. <laughs> once it's out there, it can have been replicated elsewhere. And that's kind of where some of these issues come through. I, I think Katie Rose Pritchard also did a Google image search of some of her, reverse Google image search mm. of some of her images to find that they were actually shared on other accounts as well, not just this one that she'd come across. And yeah. uh, it's just something that can be a bit worrying when you come face to face with it because there are dark corners to the internet and when you're putting content out there it can be used and misused by other people without your consent or permission very very easily yeah and i know um, we we'll, there's you know reading some reports into the dark corners of the internet when it comes to children is terrifying and for katie rose pritchard i was on her account and she is still sharing photos of her children and i'd read it all so i didn't quite know what was going on but you discovered something i'd never heard of this role playing and marie what's that yeah so that's what exactly what happened to her where you make it you take pictures and you make a fake account and people do it for all kinds of reasons so some are quite sad in that if somebody has lost a child and they see a child online that looks like their child they create account for that and that kind of helps them in some way in a grieving oh. process or others that there's like pets accounts they'll see a pet and they'll make in a whole account about it and have a whole role play around it so there's a whole kind of world of this Thing that exists, but I suppose when researchers were looking from it from Stanford, what they found is that a lot of the activity of some of the role playing accounts happens in DMs. So we don't know what's happening with them. A lot of encouragement of that kind of come and talk to me privately and that all of that kind of role playing, whatever happens, happens privately. So it's this unknown world that is just. Do you think a lot of people are aware of this? Because a lot of people who I follow who have astronomical amount of followers mm -hmm. post pictures of their children regularly. Yeah, well, that's the thing is that like a lot of the comments on social media about my article in The Independent were saying, like, how do you not know this? And I'm going, does everybody know this? Like, to me, this is new information. You know, this, I kind of realise that people can take your pictures. I understood that much. But they, the whole idea of that they could then take just this whole other level of creating this personality and world for people and that this is an engaged community mm. of people it's, I, f I just find it quite odd. I think maybe people would think it wouldn't happen to them, like the yes. darkness that is out there, because there was this whole BuzzFeed investigation into children's gymnastic videos, just kids in their back garden, you know, put uploading videos to YouTube and how paedophiles have really engaged with that community. It's horrifying and yeah. I don't want to, you know, put it's really horrifying how it can happen to anyone at Lane, but for parents who want, don't want to take an all or nothing approach, right? Mm -hmm. Say they do want to share their life or, you know, because friends, that's how people across the world are keeping up with people. Mm -hmm. What can you do to kind of ensure you're at the highest level of safety for your kids? Yeah, so I think the Rather motivation is that hard. people do want to share this content and they want to share happy moments with their families and stuff like that. And I think there's an element of that you do need to be conscious, definitely, of uh, what you're sharing and how you're sharing it. If you're public on Instagram, there's like there's about 2 billion Instagram users. So are you comfortable sharing that image with potentially 2 billion other people? 
maybe you want to think about setting up a private account and you can switch to a private account if you set up one and it's public by default and, and that is what happens on Instagram it's public by default and um, so that's one of the options that you can do is kind of check your privacy settings on all the apps that you use have a look through your followers make sure that they're all still who they say they are because people's accounts can get hacked uh, dead or inactive accounts are definitely worth clearing out if someone has kind of left a service because they're more likely to get hacked uh, because it's seen as an account that someone's not going to check up on if you hack into it oh really yeah yeah oh that makes a lot of sense yeah yeah, uh, so just kind of like being aware of who you're sharing with and when is a really good idea. Um, the scale of that sharing, have a think about that before you put a post out there. Curate your posts as well. Kind of have a think about what's in that image. Are there personally identifiable uh, elements to that image? Is your school crest on the uniform in your kid's uh, school photo? And then is their name shared? Because then, you know, a stranger will know their name and where they go to school. It's a very, very small likelihood that that will turn into something nefarious, but you don't want to take any risk when it comes to your kids. So that's just something to think about. Webwise advises that you don't share images that like place the kid in a bedroom or in a bathroom situation because they are the most commonly misused kind of images. And uh, some people decide to put emojis or stickers over their kids' faces yeah. and not use their names online. That's something that you can do. Maybe you want to share a funny image of uh, your kid, but you don't necessarily want to show their face. That's People are very tactically doing that a lot more frequently. And you can use ephemeral messaging. So Snapchat messages technically disappear. Uh, in stories on Instagram, the, the uh, yeah. stories are only up for 24 hours. Again, people can screenshot these things and there's always ways to get around the various protections and stuff like that. But the more friction you put uh, in between means that the less likelihood that someone is going to capture your image because it's a lot easier to scrape the publicly available images mm. than to try and get at private ones and scrape and try and screenshot yeah. um, stories or temporary images. It, it just it opens up the frightening thoughts that, as you say, most people think, ah, oh, it won't happen to me, but you never know. We'd love to hear from people at home on this as well. We we're going to do a bit of a poll on this that do you think think that it is right to share your pictures online or not? Um, is it right to, to share your pictures of your kids on social media? So what we want to do is there, open up the camera on your phone, hold it over the little QR code underneath where and there and get in touch with that as well if you can because yeah. we're really interested here because there's so many people mummy bloggers so many people who just put their pictures up online and never think of the consequences yeah. that could be out there well, and Amory you put it in a really interesting way that I kind of like that made me think of it another way you're like well if you left your photo album behind and someone took it. Like say you left it in a pub or you left it in a coffee shop or whatever. And you're like, well, you wouldn't want that. You'd want to get that photo album back. Mm -hmm. And I had never thought about kids' pictures online like that before. And then of course, they're so young. They, they haven't said, I want my picture everywhere. Well, this is the whole thing with the consent thing. So yeah. you ask your children with, for consent, but I mean, you can't ask a, a one or two or three year yeah. old for consent either. I mean, it's grand when it's six, seven, eight, nine, which yours mm. are, but at that, at that stage, they're not aware of what the bigger picture in yeah. on this as well. Yeah. And my nine-year-old said something really interesting, which you was saying that I don't want my pictures of things that I don't remember and strangers seeing things I don't remember. And I was going, I never even thought of it that way, of that, of course, he has no memory of being three, four, and yet his life is documented oh. and public. He yeah. said that to he you? He said that, yeah, yeah. That's interesting, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> it is. That's really interesting yeah. when you have an actual open conversation. Yeah, well, that's the, when, once you start, they have a lot of thoughts and opinions about their image being shared. And even like if I'm now sharing with family through WhatsApp, there'll be things that like my six-year-old go, no, no, don't send that. You know, they still have, you know, opinions of their image and it's... They're more aware of it than their so parents aware. are. Exactly. Um, yeah, <laughs> listen, we'd love to hear as well. Get involved in that, but also 0896 111 We'd love to hear your messages on as well. Uh, Anne-Marie O'Sullivan, thank you so much for sharing your story on that. And Elaine Burke, great to have you back with us again thank as you, well. Elaine. And the podcast is For Tech's Sake, is Elaine's podcast. For right. Tech's Sake. Uh, <laughs> Alan, what else is coming up? Well, Tommy, after the break, Derek is live from Carrick on Shannon and uh, we're going to get lessons. He's getting lessons in boating. Plus, we're going to be reading out some of your texts and emails that are coming in and uh, some more on the potty training. We're going to stay with us. We'll be right back right after these. Thanks for staying with us. Now, Derek is in Carrick on Shannon this morning. So what have you got lined up for us for the rest of the show, Derek? Yes, Al, we're live here in Carrick and Shannon, County Leitrim, right across the morning. I'll just show you where we are at the moment, Al. We're just along the banks of the River Shannon here, the uh, Shannon Blue Way that connects Carrick and Shannon right up to Drum Shambo. Now, I'm on the lookout for a boat. I'm on the lookout for a Leitrim hurler. I don't know which one is harder to find, but here he is. Well, easier to find. <laughs> Zach, I believe we have a bit of a hurling challenge coming our way if, uh, in about an hour's time. I know you're from Limerick. We'll put you here at paces. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so there you have it. 
Irish from the from uh, from the horse's mouth. <laughs> a hurling challenge coming your way. Live from Leitrim. We'll catch you later on, guys. Oh, Come on now, where's my hurley, fair. Zach? Zach, <laughs> that's the hurley's ready. What a well, legend. The pride no of Limerick is on, li on the line in Leitrim now. Oh, yes, for of our course. Derek. Limerick hurlers, all right, Derek. Don't be Come letting on, them down. Yeah. You can do it. You can um, do it. We were talking earlier on about uh, Dustin Dave, who has uh, won an award for, uh, what's the name of the award? Anorak again? of the Anorak Year. Anorak of the Year. So there's 10,000 people in this group. It's like a Facebook group, whatever else, and they love collecting different random stuff. But Dustin Dave takes pictures with bins, oh, bins. all over the, the country. I love it. Anyway, uh, Sarah has texted and said, my boyfriend has this obsession with collecting beer mats. No matter where we are, what part of the world we are, whether it's Ireland or abroad, don't get me wrong, some of them are pretty cool and interesting, but the, the thing is, where do they go? <laughs> he has them, hundreds of them, sitting all over the place and overflowing out of a drawer. I'd like your boyfriends there. I love it. It's a clutter. Do you collect, you collect stuff? I've never, myself and Tommy were just talking about this, we never collected anything. Yeah, I definitely still you have big magazines and smash hits and Just Seventeens and all that kind of stuff. Definitely. I think it's loads of people. used pencils. I used to collect little pencils. Pencils, the little pencils. ones. My mother used to collect um, glasses from everywhere. Once oh, she well, came I... home with one, we were like, where'd you get that? The European Parliament, up the... But Sinead Ryan, one of our producers here, she collects shot glasses. So anytime you're away, will you bring me a shot glass? Yeah. There you go. So we don't. She has like fridge magnets. Magnets. Oh no, fridge magnets. Yeah. Lucy hates clutter. Oh yeah. Well, yeah. But they don't last too long. But she has oh, some okay. different for a little one. Country, yeah. So <laughs> if you could send us in like mad, weird, <clears throat> dull things that you collect, or other people think are dull, or pictures as well. Oh eight nine six triple one triple one. We would love to hear from you. Um, and we'll be back with you very shortly right here on Ireland AM. Welcome back to another busy hour on Ireland AM. Now, living with domestic abuse, we're going to be meeting campaigner and survivor Priscilla Granger. She got away from her abuser and is now helping others in similar situations. She's a wonderful woman and it's just disgusting what Crazy. happened to her and we'll talk to her Frightening, and her daughter actually, in just yeah. a little while also this morning our TikTok doctor Monica Perez uh, Oike will be here taking a look at some of the latest medical news which there is quite a lot of and also Monica will be answering your health related questions so if you do have a query for her um, our doctor you can text us right now it's 089 6 111 and we'll get to as many as we possibly can yeah. okay no problem now uh, looking forward to that now let's see what's in the kitchen over to you Alan thanks Tommy now Scott Holt is back with us this morning and you're serving up a butternut squash and guys do you know what this is cabbage, cabbage. no oh, cabbage a tiny it, cabbage it's a radicchio so it's of a, course it is a, a, <laughs> cabbage <laughs> cabbage Tommy. Tommy. I mean, where, where, What's where? <laughs> it's a, it's a type know. of salad leaf so it's in season at the moment and it's kind of a bitter leaf it's a type of salad leaf yeah. so it's a cabbage no a no cabbage. A cabbage isn't a salad leaf. oh it's, no, not. it's a radicchio Okay, well, there we go. Now, now, now you know. So we're making a Your butternut radicchio. squash and a radicchio salad. salad later on with Scott. <laughs> now, the following interview contains a subject matter which may not be suitable for everyone, so viewer discretion is advised. This morning, we're joined by domestic abuse survivor Priscilla Granger and her daughter, Amy, who spent years living with their abuser and eventually managed to get away. We're also joined by Mary McDermott from Safe Ireland. You're all very welcome. It's great Thank to have you, you with much. us this morning. morning. Mary, can we just quickly start with you? We were looking at the figures on this. There's over 45,000 calls last year were made to the Gardaí about domestic abuse. We're seeing 2022, we were talking about earlier, being the worst for domestic abuse. It was shocking, frightening for so many people and things just seem to be getting worse and worse. Well, certainly uh, that would be, f those figures came out from the Gardaí last year, but those figures are not uh, shocking or surprising for those of us who work in the sector. This is an iceberg. We're only beginning to see the problem. We're beginning to get a language to speak about it. We're beginning to realise we have to respond as communities as well as families and individuals. So those figures are very familiar with anyone who's worked in the domestic violence sector and anybody 
we'll say Priscilla and Annie here, their, their stories will reflect what happens across the country. Yeah. So the figures are not shocking in any way. What is good, however, is that the Gardaí are really taking this very seriously. They're reporting it and the data is starting to come out that reflects the reality. It, it does seem like there has been a, a cultural and sea change because for years in this country, domestic abuse wasn't seen. It was behind closed doors. Mm -hmm. You know, we all watched The Family back in the 90s by Roddy Doyle. It was unbelievable. But as you said, it's hit because Priscilla, it happens for years without anyone knowing what's going on. So what happened with you? How did it all begin? Um, I married the man of my dreams, supposed to be the man of my dreams in 1995. And it kicked off literally into the early days of the honeymoon. That was the first idea that I had married an abuser. I didn't know what abuse was. Mm. I didn't know what red, red flags were. And I got the first beaten into the second night of my honeymoon because I didn't do as I was told. Um, doing as I was told was because he had forgotten to bring the passport down. And as you know, in the States, they're very strict when it comes to alcohol. Mm. And um, I got married uh, when I was 26, but I looked a lot younger. So when you go into these pubs, you're asked for your passport. Funny, he had his passport, but like, he didn't have mine. Mm. So it was an, that was the start of control, which I didn't know what control was. Yeah. And because I didn't do as I was told and sit with him down in the lobby that night and have a jar, that was the kickoff of it. So, so you thought this was a once-off? Yes. But this became a regular occurrence then? Yeah, it became my life. Um, he then tried to um, alienate me away from my family. Now, my family was my parents, Pat Nan Granger. My dad has since passed. Um, he successfully and alienate me away from all my friends who are now back in my life. Some of my oldest friends are now back in my life and came back very quickly. When I became pregnant on Amy, he fired a glass vase at me and I went into early labour and Amy had to be injected with steroids into her heart, liver and kidneys in case the, I went into labour and Amy was born, but successfully it worked. Do I think Amy experienced the trauma? Absolutely, during the pregnancy. They, they do say, and I have spoken to an awful lot of counsellors and specialists with that, when you are pregnant, that is the highest point of domestic violence is when it hits. Because remember, the actual, um, you know, they're not going to be the number one anymore in the yeah. marriage, yeah. okay? Mm -hmm. Be yeah. it man or woman, they're not going to be the number one anymore. Mm -hmm. This little infant is now going to come into their lives mm -hmm. and you are responsible. I then, when Amy was born, I tried to get away when she was nine months old and he successfully lured me back because he attempted, he threatened suicide. And I went back. And I don't know how many times it took me after that. And eventually I got away from him after a long, long, nine times. What year did you get away from him? Eventually, I got away from him in 2011. So you got married in 1995, 2011. 11. Amy, you know, you were born two years after you got married? Yes, two years 98. After, 19, 1998. Yeah. yeah. So 2011 is when your mum got away. Mm -hmm. You must have seen, like, this, is, this was your life when you were growing up. Yeah, it was my life. And a lot of people ask me, you know, how do you feel about it? It was normal for me because you're brought into the world who you automatically know by two parents. And as you grow up, <clears throat> they are given a responsibility to look after a child. And my mom gave me the greatest childhood ever. But unfortunately, our abuser didn't. So for me, every day, I thought this is what goes on in every single home in Ireland every day. I wouldn't go into school and ask, does your mom, does your dad hit your mom? Are you being abused? Are you being called names? Are you being abused as a child? Because we look up to our parents in order to grow up, and that was normal for me. Did he act differently around you? Yeah, it was the sneakiness of things, and I always say children are very smart. They know more things than parents mm. know. Um, and it would be the likes of small little things, you know, kind of egging you on, you know, who's your favourite mom or dad, or, you know, your mom's a drama queen, or saying these things to your child. Yeah. And then it makes you think, oh, maybe mommy is mad, or, is what's daddy trying to make me believe, you know? We have these words now, gaslighting. You know, yeah. we, have, we, we didn't have those. Mm -hmm. When you were going through, like, everything you're saying there now, we're like, that's the script of an abuser. When we, yeah, and when we were writing the book and Shane... This is your book yeah, here, safe. safe. When we were writing our book and Shane Doran, the author, 
Shane sent up the drafts. And Amy took the drafts one night. It actually upset me, right? And she says, Mum, did you not know what a red flag was? And I went... What? How would you know? Yeah. And she says, but, Mum, a red flag is X, Y and Z. So, thank God, Amy's age now know what red flags are. Yeah. But women and men probably come back in... And I mean, that's 95. It's not come back in 1966. Mm -hmm. We didn't know what a red flag was. But you did try to get to a refuge. I mean, Mary, I bring you in on this as well, because we're seeing that there has been an increase in spend and trying to open up more refuges. But it's still a situation where people are trying to leave the home and they can't get out of the house. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, from the point of view of Safe Ireland, we're a national network of refuges and services around the country. Ireland does fall short in the provision of refuge, but refuge alone is not the response to domestic violence. What we need is, from our point of view, what we want is any woman or indeed any man or any child can walk out of their home and get an, an exit pathway out of an abusive situation. That is the goal. They can go to their guards, they can go to their doctor, they can go to their social worker, they can speak to their teachers and, of course, they can access their local uh, domestic violence service to get out. And we need protections. That's and the we're goal, going a long though, way. but is yeah, it...? Yeah, no, no, we're on the way to it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And it, as Mary said, and Amy and I will keep saying this, we need a wraparound service. Wouldn't you agree, Mary? Yes, We yes. need a complete wraparound service where we're all working together and the main person that we're helping is the victims of domestic violence, be it male or female, and children as well, which is not being cared for. See, the thing is with children, when you think about your developing and yeah. how your brain development changes at what mm. you see, so whether you are a girl to identify as a girl and you're yeah. like, well, this is what's going to happen to me when I'm older. Yeah. Or you're a child, a boy, who's like, well, this is what boys, this is what men do. Yeah. It completely changes children from yeah. such a young age yeah. and it perpetuates the cycle of violence. Yeah. When you were going through all of this, and I can't believe this about your story, Priscilla, a friend of yours, a childhood friend, someone you had been alienated from, Sarah McLaughlin, she was murdered by her partner. Yeah, Siobhan McLaughlin. Siobhan McLaughlin was murdered by Brian Carney. And again... Both Siobhan and I, but Siobhan doesn't know it because she's obviously gone. We were both alienated away from each other because we were extremely two independent, vibrant young women, OK? Very successful. Siobhan was very successful in business, as I was. And when Siobhan was murdered, it was Siobhan's murder that caused me to realise, wake up here, Priscilla, if you don't get out, you're going the same road. You'd be a figure. I, I, I do statistic. believe. And only on Sunday, Amy asked me, would she bring me out, would she bring her out to see where I live? Because we lived out in North County Dublin, out in the ward. And I took her out. And I retraced all my... I retraced all my childhood steps with Siobhan. And I then realised how lucky I was to be alive and have Amy in my life. Mm. Because I could have been a statistic. You could have been. Who was ever going to talk about Priscilla Granger again? Yeah. Nobody. Who talks about Siobhan McLaughlin? Only the likes of ourselves, the McLaughlin family. The next time her name will be brought up is when probably Brian Kearney makes an application to get out on parole. He should be left, in, he should be left where he is, locked up. Mm. That family have lost their daughter. She's never coming back. And it's a life sentence. And we're, you know, it's a year on from Ashley Murphy. I know it's a different sort of a situation, yeah. but a year on from her murder. And we know her name, but there's so many names yeah. that How we don't know. How many more names know. has there been since Ashley Murphy? How many more? So many. Well, there have been 12 in 20, 2022. 52% yeah. of all um, murders and or killings have been uh, related to domestic violence. The guard the data is getting better on this. But really, I mean, wherein you mentioned there, you know, the, the gender stereotyping in an abusive house yeah. and how people mightn't recognise it as they grow into it. Yeah. But this is true of all our households. This is part of the problem. We really, really have to look at sex and gender stereotyping. Priscilla, are you OK? Yeah, fine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. How, how did you get out? Because for people who could be watching this this morning, could be in a similar situation, who there's a lot of these red flags are triggering. What, what, you obviously mentioned something gave you the reason to do it, but what? One night, Amy witnessed, uh, Amy witnessed a beating. And I said, that's it. He's not putting his hands on me again. He actually had kicked me. And I said, he's not putting his hands on me again. And Amy went to school and I 
came home and she said, Mum, Dad has a second phone again. And I said, OK, that's it. So he went off to work. I put Amy into a safe house and I rang a friend of mine. And I said to him, look, you have a security company. I can't afford to pay you now. I have a protection order in place because I had a protection order in my marriage. I'm asking you, I said, will you come over tonight? I said, and don't let him back into the house. He said, Priscilla, it's not a barring order. I said, I know it's not a barring order. But I said, his name was not on the house. I'm pleading with you. And he came over with a security firm. And he arrived back up at 1.30. And the security team went out and they said, you're not wanted here. Get away. There's a copy of the safety order. And go. And he left. And he left. And he was gone. And then he threatened suicide again. And he'd promised Amy he'd become a good dad and he went into a psychiatric hospital to try and get better. It was all a game to get back into the house. But he did never got back into the house. But then he dragged us through the courts to try and take the family home, which was my family home before I got married, off me, and dragged us through the courts for six and a half years solid mm -hmm. and left us with a bill of a quarter of a million. So a lot of people, though, who he wasn't on the name of the house, no. which is amazing, but there's a lot of people... Have who, them on the house? Yeah. And that's the battle. And that's why we set up Stop Domestic Violence in Ireland for people to come to us because we have a fantastic team of solicitors on board, we have barristers on board. We're not going to be able to solve it. Nobody's going to be able to solve domestic violence, but we're all going to be able to give the correct advice. Did he ever go to prison for beating the crap out of you? No, because domestic violence is not a crime. You, you're being a spy in your own home, mm. Amy. So I'm assuming the second phone is for, for oh, an other life he yeah. was leading. Yeah, a second life. Um, and you learn to you learn to live with it because that's all you know. And but you knew something at, at 12 years of it. You're like there's yeah. something up here. Yeah, because and I always say this: when a mother has a protective instinct, automatically a child will bounce off that. Oh yeah, mm. big time. And only for, and I will say it to this day. Only for Mick McCaffrey, who was the crime correspondent with the Sunday World. Who's, yeah. Who's here, here, right? right here, yeah. And the Sunday World. I don't believe Amy and I would be alive today because we discovered that our abuser was operating uh, brothels and was a pimp in the Dublin 4 area. My goodness. What? And he... thank God we're alive. Yeah. But there's so many others. But uh, God help the other people that are there. But as I say, women's aid are there, safer, the, safer there, safe Ireland are there. We're here. Mm. Amy is always here on the phone. I'm always on the phone. Mm. It's become your life to try to help other people. Yeah, we love it's it. become your life to try to help other people, We're and we know. About it. And the reason why we do it is because I know it's so easy for someone to say, you know, go get a safety order, go get a barren order. It's not that easy if someone's in that frame of mind and they're going, I need to get out of this life, I need to have a better life for me. And if there's children involved, whether, whether it be a man or woman, you have to give them the strength to leave. And until you've walked in a victim's shoes, you have no idea the emotions they're feeling. Uh, the strength to leave, but the ability to leave and, the, and the work that you're doing, Priscilla and Amy, I mean, like all of you, and it is just incredible. But to think that still, the difficulties and the hurdles people have to jump over to do it is just crazy. Tom, can as I just well. say, I think it's very important that your your listeners and the audience really realise that since 2019, course of control is a crime. Yeah. Marital rape came in shockingly in 1990. So there are an entire array of of um, you know legal procedures. The problem is the resourcing, yeah. the judicial training. Yeah. Mm. court services, policing, all of these things need to be put in place, yeah. but they are changing. And voices like Priscilla and Amy, yeah. our own, are all there. There's expertise there. But the biggest thing, I think, since COVID, and this is really important, is that we are beginning to have a vocabulary to speak about this. Yes. This is all privatised stigma, shame, yeah. silence. We're stopping it and we're starting to speak about it. So I think it's really important not oh, to think that there are no routes out. There are. Yeah. And we, we advise people to contact their local services. Yeah. We have to think that there's some that there, there is some hope in and this. There is. Mary McDermott, CEO of Safe Ireland, and Amy and Priscilla Granger, thank you so much for thank taking the time so and being like this. It's it's spectacular. I can't believe you can do this. And uh, right now there is a three part uh, series until death. It examines the issue of domestic abuse and femicide in Ireland over the last 
three decades, something that a spotlight needs to be shun upon. It's available on the Virgin Media Player. Right and of now. course, if you do want to know more about Priscilla and Annie's story, their book, Safe, is there. <laughs> Well, it's great to have you back. Now, Scott Holder is back with us in the kitchen. Good morning to you, Scott. What are you serving Good morning. up for us? So we're going to do a nice, vibrant, tasty, healthy salad. Gorgeous. <laughs> Gorgeous. Gorgeous. Butternut squash and radicchio. Oh, you're giving it to me already, are you? Giving it to you start oh, there? Yeah. Okay, well, there you start I'm, on that. I'm going to get cracking Fresh. on the butternut squash. Look. So just going to peel yum. it. I use a peeler, but you can use a knife. Okay, right. Slice the two ends. Slice it there where it kind of bellies out. You, you can't cut. You can't cook one of those full or whole, can you? You're better off to because look at all the stuff all inside the seeds, it, seeds all the and seeds stuff. and everything. You can, or you can you can cut it in half and and roast it in the oven. Okay. Even with the skin on. Is that warm? Is this warm here, Scott? That's warm. Oh, it is warm. Mmm. I love butternut squash. Do you? Mmm. -hmm. Yum. I don't think I've ever had butternut squash. Oh, yeah. Is it a no. first for everything? Oh, so we're gonna. You no, know I just, I don't like. I don't think I've ever had it cooked like that. We're gonna slice that into okay. nice wedges. Yeah, they are. They're lovely wedges. Give it a little got. toss. Olive oil, salt. Could you make these like instead of having potatoes? Yeah. And pepper for yeah. For, yeah. for 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 dinner. Do I do a nice butternut squash risotto? Oh, very oh, nice. Oh, very yeah, posh. Very nice. Do yeah, you very actually nice. make a butternut squash risotto? Mm -hmm. so you should do cooking here one into morning. The oven, and they'll roast for about 30 minutes at 160 degrees. Okay, 100, uh, oh, 160, so kind of low yeah. and and you kind of low and slow almost. Pomegranate or wine apple. Going to okay. cut that in half, hold it over the bowl, and give it a. Whack the life out of it. We're going over there with the back of the spoon. Oh, right, that's how you do it. So you that's don't scrape them out or no, anything? No, 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 because no, it's got all these membranes in it, and this way they all just pop out and the membrane stays in there. Oh, there you go. I never knew that. So that's just a real kick to that. Yeah, it's lovely. What's the, what's the kick? So we've got a bit of lime and chipotle dressing. Ah, we're okay. getting to that in a minute. Right. Okay, there we go. Pomegranate there we go. bash. So that's our pomegranate. Leave mm. that there. And then we're going to make our... Lime and chipotle dressing. So we've got lime and lemon juice and zest. We're gonna go honey. So and that's just that's just a, a, a lime squeezed into that. The juice of Le the lime. Lemon and lime with the zest as well. I always use the zest because it just gives it a really nice zesty flavour. And are you saying that that's all that's giving me the kick off yeah. that? Really? really? Yeah. Wow. And then our olive oil. What did you scoop in there? Sorry, you missed. You did the scoop. The, that's the chipotle puree. Okay, right. So, so that's where the then, kick is out. Just like a little cocktail shaker, we're going to give that a shake. And can leave Sorry, that. I'm lost. What the chipotle? What's chipotle? Chipotle, chipotle is, kind of like is a, a Mexican chili. chili. Ah, that's so what I'm getting the puree, kick yeah. off. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm getting a chipotle. We make mm. a little cocktail shaker salad dressing there. Yeah. yeah. So then you can just leave that in the fridge, and whenever you want, you have a salad dressing ready to go. How long would that last? Um, that would last easily a week, could last longer, but... Just keep it in the fridge. Yeah, 100%. Right. And fabulous. I do all the salad dressings like that. That's beyond. OK. OK. Then we're going to take our radicchio. Now, this is what we were having a so lot this is, what I, so I, I thought it was a cabbage. Cabbage. earlier on, the let thought it was cabbage. This is a kind of winter salad leaf, so it's in season right now. It's a little bit bitter. It's a little bit like that's a red endive. It's very similar. <laughs> Okay. Where do you get these? So the <laughs> do you get these like in your in, supermarket? You get them in a green you, grocery You should I'm sure. be able to get this in pretty common because it's in season right now. Um, Fallon and Burn in town has it. Well, if you're not going, if you're not yeah. in town. Well, <laughs> well I, I don't have the, uh, sure the store list for Ireland, Ireland for yeah, DPO, of course. But, So we'll take out our butternut squash that's nicely roasted there. Okay. Caramelized. And so how long do you leave them in for? So that would be about 30 half minutes an hour. Half an hour at 160, 160 degrees. And you essentially just Descend want... this, Alan, if you're listening. <laughs> when, you, when you put a knife in there, you don't want any resistance. But, like, you could get it nice... Could you make it browner and keep it in for a little longer if you wanted a bit more brown on it, a bit more... I, I'm going to say no to that. I think it's perfectly cooked. Oh, OK. I don't know why you'd... Uh, <laughs> want it it's, any it's, to be fair, Scott, it is delicious. Like, the pomegranate with the goat's cheese. Uh, it is, no, feta cheese. Yeah, is it's that? a feta. It's actually an Irish feta, macroom feta from um, Cork. We're going to toss our dressing 
Like it's pretty well, healthy. Like, like that's pretty really much healthy. As healthy but you could also get, have this it? with like a, a piece of grilled chicken. Yeah, or like some or fish. A steak or something, whatever else. And then you just put the goat's cheese in on top of that and that you're done. Yeah. So we'll just dress Love this it. up really nicely and the salad leaves. The radicchio gives it some nice colour. Scott. Light. Here we That's go. Lovely. Love it. No, no, you're, it's delicious there. Yeah. And then just a little goat's cheese goes on top of that. And yeah, it's so done. We have toasted seeds here. Yeah, we're running Sesame. out. We're out of time. We're out of time. Pomegranate. And, and goat's cheese. Feta. There you go. Or feta Scott, cheese. Go. Look at that. Alan can eat that one. <laughs> I pretty much devoured this one. Thank you so much. It's well, thank you so much. It. it looks lovely and colourful as well. Now, after the break, we're getting the latest health news with our TikTok doc. We'll see you in a few minutes. Thanks for staying with us now. There's lots of health stories dominating the news of late. Indeed. Joining us to go through them is our go-to GP, Dr. Monica Perez. Okay, listen, we're not going to waste the time. You're not going to be able to solve the overcrowding crisis sitting here <laughs> with us today. But on the front of the Irish Daily Mail uh, is the headline, too many first-time mothers are having C-sections. And this is a Trinity study. Mm -hmm. And it's down to litigation fears by doctors. I um, I don't think that's uh, truly correct because there's so many factors that influence when a woman gets C-sections. Yeah. I just like to point out I am a GP, so I don't do sections. But we need to know that the maternal age is rising. So instead of like 20 years ago where people are younger and get, and get uh, given their first child in their 20s, now some first time mothers are in the 40s mm -hmm. and then there are complications that could um, that could influence that decision so you yeah, have so is it safer to have a c section than in some cases it is it, it is. is safer yes yeah. so it's all down to what's safe for the baby and the mom as well so I don't think litigation will be the thing that will influence in the decision for a C-section. Yeah. Right. So it's just interesting what's happening. Uh, they're pushing for uh, calls for immediate action to curb rate of C-section. Senior obstetricians and midwives contributing to the report said so the rising age of mothers as well as excess weight and treatment for fertility were leading doctors to push for C-sections uh, in, in, in contrast to other countries. Mm. So that's what's happening um, in Ireland. I'm sure we'll be hearing a lot more about, about that. And if you've got an opinion, 0896 111 And now, we don't have Tommy sitting down here because I think he'd, he'd lose his top. We're talking about COVID, oh. which he loves to do. New variant with an, an, the Kraken. Yes. It sounds very ominous. Yeah. ominous. Yeah. <laughs> What's going on here? So the Kraken uh, variant is also a variant of the Omicron virus. Um, and it was discovered in America a couple of months ago. Mm -hmm. And it did now realise that over 40% of the cases of um, COVID over Christmas time is the Kraken variant as well. So what has happened is that it's easily transmissible. So we know from, was it years ago, the Omicron came out that it was highly transmissible yeah. and also people are sicker with it. So with the Kraken as well, it's the same way. And, but it's not like a completely new disease and people shouldn't freak out. But the most important thing is that make sure your vaccination is up to date. And also if you do have symptoms, do you stay away from other people, isolate, so that we reduce the spread of this? Because are you saying that the, if you are vaccinated at the moment, that it is you are protected against this, or is there a, is there a type of variant in this that it's it's evading the vaccinations that we have? Or if you have your vaccine, are you okay? No vaccine is 100%. Mm. So um, due to the fact that the, now, the booster vaccines now does have a component of the Omicron virus to protect you from, yeah. from it. So it will uh, offer some level of protection. But at the end of the day, we do have to practice the things that we should do. So if you're in a crowded place, um, maybe wear a mask and wash your hands easily. The winter time is a high time for loads of viruses to be transmissible. We have the flu virus, we have RSV. Mm. We have so many things going around. So... Yeah, so, but, but the vaccination does play a part. Mm. So I know the HSC is calling for the younger population to get their second booster vaccines and it is available and I will encourage people to get that. Yeah, because I know that the VAT rate on um, COVID tests is back on as of January the 1st. So they're 23% mm. more expensive than they were last year when there was no VAT on them. Mm. And for you... Like, as a GP, because we've been talking about overcrowding in hospitals and the fact that GPs are being overrun, I can imagine, with what's going on with all the pulmonary uh, issues, that it's just been crazy busy. It has been over Christmas. Uh, I was on call, so the on-call GP service in Cork is called South Dock, and we were inundated with so many cases, so many different kinds of respiratory, and we know about the group A again, 
for the children as well. So we're all trying our best. And in all fairness, a lot of patients are very understanding mm -hmm. and most people do present when they are unwell. So we just encourage people to just take things easy and present to your doctor if you think you need um, help. Yeah, absolutely. And there is, the, we're speaking of children there, and there's the, the flu vaccine clinics for children. Now, yeah. now set up and you just walk in, they're free, no appointment is necessary. Yes. The, the vaccine is... Should this not have been done before Christmas? It was available, so... Um, but so there was no highlighting of it. I believe there was. Is <laughs> To the extent that you needed, that people knew that they could go to these clinics? Well, the clinics weren't available The clinics Christmas. were not available, um, but uh, the flu vaccine was available with your GP, and most GPs did put, put out memos. And I think... Um, it's just because most people might see the flu, um, that flu is something that is very common and they feel like it's older people that get quite unwell with it. So there's more push for the older population yeah. and people that are immunocompromised to um, to get the vaccine. But I don't understand that we have recommended this after a lot of research. There was over 10 year research in, in the UK. That, that was why we brought it in. Um, I think, was it 2020? We brought out the, the flu vaccine for, for kids in Ireland yeah. as well. And we need to also understand the flu vaccine for kids from from age two to 17 is actually a nasal vaccine. Yeah, so literally, it looked... it's so fr kid friendly. Yeah. I wish all vaccines could be that yeah. way, but it's not possible. So, and it's effective. You get the vaccine up each nostrils. After two weeks, it offers a level of protection to the flu. So, and kids can get on well with it. Yeah, they can yeah, end up they in the can hospital. hospital. Yeah. I heard a woman on the radio yesterday which her two kids went in and she said it was nothing. They literally just, they that's walked, they yeah. went into their pharmacy, yeah. walked out. It was actually nothing. They got a lollipop each and, and it was grand. Yeah, yeah. And stickers as well. <laughs> You need to get to your consult with Monica. Yeah. Now. It's like, no, like, he wants to do that. He's like, I need Monica, I need to talk to you about a few things. Uh, you can find, of course, on TikTok and Instagram, Dr. Monica Perez. Okay, thank you so much for joining us today. We'll be back with you on Ireland AM very shortly. Do you want to head out? Yeah. Here? I'm so glad you're back so we can stop having the conversation. We just were coming up on Ireland AM. Something, to, well, we'll let you into it. Tommy, you've got a vested interest in this next thing. Poo. <laughs> so you decided to dress. <laughs> All the lads are like, so we're talking about right poo and you to decide. This is a very healthy coloured, I would say, if it was fecal matter. Anyway. Oh, no <laughs> nappies needed. It's the controversial method that teaches babies to go to the toilet on <laughs> cue. Hey. It's an actual thing, trust me. I mean, we are in the middle of potty train at the minute. It's chaos, but our guest is able to potty train her son. He's eight months old. We're going to find out more about that at 20 past nine. Tommy has come in in the morning and he's gone. He takes out his phone and he's like, take a look at this. And it's just where Jamie is. <laughs> Poo around no, his house. Yes, he does. Alan, someone who could talk to us about the colour of it, our TikTok no, doctor. I'm, yes, is our TikTok doctor. People are having their saying, breakfast. Sorry. Yes, having remember. your sorry. breakfast. That's right. We're in uh, Dr. Monica Perez. We'll be answering all your health related queries. So if there's anything you'd like answered, text us or leave us a, a voice note on 0896 111111. Now, Derek is on a boat doing a hurley challenge in Carrick on Shannon. <laughs> Only Derek. Only Derek could do that. Only Ireland the yeah, man. You couldn't make it up. Come here. We're on a boat on the River Shannon with a lead from Hurler. Zach Moran, he is with us. Zach, are you looking forward to the Hurler Challenge now? I am, yeah. A bit cold. It might warm up. So. It might warm up a little bit, yeah. And come here, we're getting... Do we look like brothers? We're kind of getting a lot of uh, a lot of messages in saying we look like bros. We're kind of twitted this morning. Look, he's got the beard and the hair. Yeah, I think... Uh, yeah. Zach, am I, he's the, the handsome brother, is it? Mm, oh, yeah. don't do that. Oh, don't do that. Oh, don't do that. Oh, he doesn't like... He's not going to like that. That's not good. I'm going to bring this Hurley back to Dublin. <laughs> Looking forward to a hurling channel challenge as they're on a boat. I don't think Zach even knew what he was going to be They might get off there. Hello, welcome back. Now, earlier on, we were uh, speaking to a journalist who's decided to get rid of all of the pictures of her children online. She was just worried about this uh, thing about role-playing where people are robbing people's mm. children and creating it's whole lives. Yeah, it scary, is. Yeah. So we're asking you to get involved in our poll today, which uh, is right there. Is it right to share pictures of children on social media? Of course, there's issues with consent. The kids can't do that. So if you could just get involved in the QR code right there and we will have the results of that poll for you later on in the show. We were we also have. talking about... Yes, we are also talking about uh, uh, Dull Dave is a man who won <laughs> the award over in America. He, uh, are no, you uh, calling him Dull Dave? Well, he's called Dustbin Dave, actually, right? <laughs> uh, he won the Anorak of the Year, which is a big 
club in the UK. There's over 10,000 people yeah. who are part of this Anorak of the Year who collect all sorts of crazy things from milk bottles to following brown tourist signs to all sorts of crazy stuff like collecting pencils like Murren did. Murren. Small pencils, not big ones, small ones. They have to be the small ones. So we have a lot of uh, texts in about all those things that people have collected. Kieran said, I collected call cards when I was a kid. Couldn't walk past a phone box without checking to see if there's one left behind. No idea why, but there's fairly zero value in them, I imagine. Probably not. There were some quite cool ones back in the day, I remember. Yeah. Yeah. Thomas likes to collect rocks. Anywhere he goes in Ireland, he gets a rock, puts it in the boot of the car, and then puts it in his garden. But at least the garden is a nice place to have your rocks. That's that you so could, lovely. Yeah. So it's not He's like clogging up your house. He's off his rock. Alan uh, Hughes? No, my fad <laughs> seems to be collecting pens. I picked them up at exhibitions, and I don't know if you've ever been to the Holiday World show. You should have been there. Pens are in abundance. So I'm going again this year. Some of them are quite expensive. <laughs> that said, I've got a drawer full of them. So he just collects his pens. There you go. I mean, it's not quite up there with Dustbin Dave, now to be fair. No. I don't see, know. You should say, look at this guy. He's got pictures beside all different dustbins. He's in a dustbin and one and of them And he's talking about uh, all the he different is, whack, him. Like, look at him. And he talks about all the di- how, what makes a good dustbin. A medium a size, bin. but with a big opening. <laughs> uh, oh, Dustbin Dave, thank you so much for making us happy he this morning. There? He's, he's in, in a, a bin. bin Get there. in the bin. I love how his uh, wife and children just accept it. They just accept that's where he is and that's what he likes. So he loves <laughs> dustbins. Have you ever seen these people who plane spotting? But I sort of understand that as well. Yeah. Do you? <laughs> Do you? <laughs> tell us more, actually. Because we're meant to be going to a wreck, but tell us no, this. No, because you just go, no, I'd love to be on that going somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> OK, it's not quite the same. Uh, then anyway, Dave says, you can't beat a good old classic. You're looking at it going, I'd love to be on that. <gasps> Coming up, can you party train a baby after just a few weeks? Who knows? Well, one woman says you can, and we're going to be meeting and talking to her about it after the break. Oh, can you potty child, a uh, child from birth? <laughs> potty train a child from birth. <laughs> potty child. Sorry, we're discussing this because my head's can blown with this. I am potty training my two and a half year old at the minute and my brain is already gone. But potty brain. I'm learning now that you can do it from birth. Apparently, the process is called elimination communication. And to tell us more about it, we're joined by a protect- practitioner, Ashling Fitzgibbon. Ashling, thank you so much for joining Very us. Nice Before we start, Tommy's like, but hold on now. And what about, what is yeah. this elimination communication? Okay, so it is a gentle, non-coercive way to respond to your baby's natural hygiene needs. So like all mammals, human babies have a natural instinct to not want to soil themselves. And they actually clearly demonstrate this from birth. So they'll give signals. So EC is about learning those signals and then the natural timings. And you're assisting your child to use the potty um, until they can naturally gain independence, which is around 9 to 18 months, depending on the child. OK, so I think we do have some footage of you doing this, following mm-hmm. your son, Rian, around as well. So you have this little, um, what do you call that? Top hat. Top, a top hat, hat. Yeah. OK. So you just hold it, kind of Rian sitting on it then? Yeah, yeah. So whenever... what, what you do is you pop it in between your legs, which is why it's lovely designed, and then you place the child on your... So we're like, looking at you oh, doing yeah, it here with Rian. Oh, yeah, you can see it. Right now. Okay, so so, so he... he's positioned and he's <laughs> on the back. I'm, yeah, I'm holding him in position. And then I'm doing sign language for potty. So oh we're building, we're building this, that's the sound, that's the association then. Um, and then you, you make the sound, you know, psh, psh, and you say, you're going on the potty. So he's building that language association from the very beginning. So you do the sign language as yeah, well? Yeah, you do the sign language. So he's learning, like, that's potty. Yeah. So this is, can we just see, you hold yeah, that yeah. up there, how small it actually is. Because when we think of a potty, we think of a yeah. big yoke yeah, yeah. that a baby, <laughs> like, will fall into. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But this is... This what? is designed from birth, yeah. This is like it's been made by parents that do this practice. And why, can I ask you why you decided to do, we'll get to the signals, the natural yeah. signals, but why you decided to do this? Because I imagine that this is quite time consuming. Why well, mm-hmm. yeah, well, I, I was interviewing a lady for a podcast and she was like, oh, my son was out of diaper, she's American, by 14 months. And I said, oh my gosh, 14 months, how is this possible? She said, oh, I did elimination communication. And that was the first time I heard of it. Um, and then when I was pregnant, I got an audio book, Go Diaper Free, and I was listening to it and I thought, hmm, this sounds doable. And the lady who was teaching the book has five kids and she's done it with five kids and they've gone to daycare. So, and she has two companies and, you know, she's not like 
She's not following them around she's not with following a them posse around with a all posse. day long. Yeah, so she's but made it like for a modern culture. You know, like, so this would have been done before nappies were around. Yeah. But now this has been applied to like how we live in modern times. What's the benefit of it? Because if you're saying go nappy free, like nappies mm. are expensive. Mm. So if you reckon you can have no nappies from birth, like it's going to save a lot of money. Yeah. Well, you see, you use the, the, the toilet is the potty. But we have also, you know, because a baby's going to, as you know yourself, they're peeing and pooing quite frequently. Yeah. So you you can use a, like the backup of a nappy. So I, I use cloth nappies. Oh, so you do have Yeah, nappies. I do use nappies. So like Reen is wearing a nappy right now. Uh, and traveling. what about like in your furniture and stuff? Because if he's up and about at this oh, stage. Yeah, yeah. No, he's wearing, he's wearing his nappy. And then as soon as he's walking, I'll be taking him out of nappies and putting him into the next backup will be his, un he'll be wearing underpants. Um, so yeah, by that stage, he'll be. From what age is that? From, from, well, year? I think he'll be maybe walking around nine and a half months by the, the looks of us. Okay. He's Sorry, Rian's outside and he looks like he's a year and a half. He's climbing <laughs> he's everywhere, huge. walking. He's a like he's a gorgeous little thing. You were talking about the, see, this is what I think about because yeah. you know I was with a baby yesterday and I'm like, oh, that baby's doing a poo because mm -hmm. you can tell. Yeah. You know, the face goes red and they're kind of strugg yeah. struggling. But the fact is, is that I suppose your eyes aren't always on mm -hmm. the child, so you're looking out for signals, mm -hmm. but you can't always be looking, right? Yeah, you can't. Oh, like you're not going to catch every single thing. The re really, the practice is about like doing it consistently, and so then over time, like the child, you don't even have to really potty train them. It, it just naturally will happen. That transition will happen. So, you know, you're you're doing that window before they become two when they hit that kind of no, you know, mm, that resistance yeah. to you. So. Yeah, you're kind of like that Montessori window, they say, is between 12 to 18 months is the ideal time to actually um, get them out of nappies. Right. Uh, yeah. It's interesting. Uh, what about if you want to go back to work, for instance, and mm -hmm. you have to hand your child over to a minder or a, a creche? Like, are yeah. creches, are they open to this sort of stuff? Or would they be kind of closed to kind of It depends of on who's things? running it, really. I have a cousin down in Wexford, and she's become very open to it. Um, she, she has a preschool down in Wexford. Um, so she's, like, very open to it and, you know, we'll share it with parents and things like that. So it really depends on, you know, where you're sending your kids to and whether they are open to trying it. Mm -hmm. um, and I suppose it's just about being really educating people that it's not actually that hard and say, if you're doing a nappy change, offer them the potty. They'll often go then, Do you know, because they actually sometimes can, you know, not want to go in the nappy. Mm. Um, so, yeah, it's just about saying, OK, like, if, say that baby was making that face, it's just a case of bringing them to the bathroom or changing room, taking off the nappy, offering them the potty, and they'll, they'll go on it. You just signal, you make this, you know, you'll do psh, psh, if they go for the pee, and then you go mm -mm, for the poo. And so I you're... feel like oh, it's like suck, 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 suck with cows, you know what <laughs> yeah, I mean? You're yeah. just psh, psh. Yeah. It's like what, the cat's like, What okay. do your friends make of this, or family even? Well, my dad thought I was off the wall when I told him when I was pregnant. Uh, I sent him some pictures. He was like, what? Like, of a newborn on the top hat. Yeah. Thinking, oh, he think it's great. He was like, this is crazy. Um, but then he came over, he's living in England, he came over when Reen was born. Once he saw it in action, he loved it. Um, he thought it, he, like, it makes total sense and he really advocates for it now. And Rian himself, like say, you know, he kind of thinks that he needs to go to the toilet. Mm -hmm. Again, they've got natural systems, right? Yeah. Like you can tell when the kids need to... Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. well, you can, but like, yeah. Not a wee, really. I think with a poo, definitely, or the if it's an uncomfortable very one. Very obvious, yeah. Yeah, but, but if even... they need to just do a wee, like... I mean, personally, you'd have to have eyes on all the time, which I find would be quite difficult. But yeah. But the thing is, it's not, it's not even about doing it. when they're mobile. It's not so much the signals. The signals are very, very obvious when they're a newborn. Mm. That's the kind of time when you learn those. Whereas when they go to the next phase of being mobile, they're so busy in their task of learning yeah. that they're not really giving those signals as much. Yeah. So then it's about just doing the natural timing, like so when they're waking after a nap, you know, there's those key times, like ourselves, when well, we wake up. What about when they don't want to sit on the toilet? Do you know, it, they don't want to sit on the top hat? If, if they're, starting, if they're they kind of wiggling and stuff like that, I find now, Rian, um, I have to kind of entertain him, so I'll get, like, books and toys and stuff like that. And once, okay. he, once he has something to play with, he's kind of like, Psh, relaxed out, you know, just chilling on the toilet. <laughs> Relaxing me out as well, that's <laughs> yeah. kind of nice. I'm, it's, I'm, just, I'm just about to say, you can't go yet. <laughs> yeah. Would he, because this, he doesn't know any different. Yeah. He's had this from birth. From birth, yeah. And, you know, doing, because it's fascinating watching babies learn sign language mm -hmm. from birth, mm -hmm. you know, if they've got non-hearing parents. Yeah. How quickly they pick up on yeah. it. Yeah. So, if this is, does he go looking for it sometimes? Yeah, he can actually, you can see him sometimes looking at looking it. Looking at yeah, it. Yeah. And you're like, oh, maybe I think maybe the red is so, you know, it's like he knows what it is. And I think, like, I don't, he's not there yet, but I've seen other parents um, saying that 
once they actually, they've learned it so much that they actually will start to give their own signals. They'll go, you, they'll actually make sounds and everything. Do you oh, get you, a lot of criticism on this? Like, do you talk, because we, we have a message on this from Phyllis said, me and my sister-in-law have kids the same age. She sat her baby on a potty for four months. Mm -hmm. He would sit there after meals, do a poo, would sometimes sit for up to 20 minutes. This is not toilet training. It's just not using nappies and I find it very strange. Children's urge and sphincter muscle doesn't actually work until they're closer to two. Now at three years of age, my child is toilet trained, but my nephew is still having accidents and wearing nappies by night. You must come across a lot of parents mm -hmm. who have their opinions on this. Oh yeah, yeah. There's a lot of a lot of opinions that are like not not positive of it, but I think anyone who has done it and has yeah. really gone the journey with it has had nothing but a positive experience. And it works for you. Like yeah, it, it works for you me. You want to give yeah. it your give a go at it, and, and yeah. And I was saying like we're going to be touring this year, so we're going to be in a camper van. Um, so that was like a real strong motivation to, you know, give this a good go because I thought it's going to make it much easier. Um, like you're him... going for eight months yeah. around Europe yeah. in a camper van. Mm -hmm. Like nappies are going to, like, you know, they, they go to fast. landfill and, you yeah, know, yeah. they're environmentally bad. Yeah. So you're like, they're going to fill up the camper van. Yeah, exactly. Do you find, I just find it very interesting when it comes to, I'm not a parent. Well, people have such strong opinions on parenting that yeah. you're like, I'm not, a, you don't have to do it. Like, no. just, it's not, yeah. this is what I do. Yeah. I'm not telling you everyone in the world should be doing no, this. No, not at all. Yeah. And that's, that's it. And I think a lot of people, um, like, that's the reason we started sharing our videos was just to kind of put it out there for people to see, yeah. is it something they want to try? And if it works for their lifestyle, and if it, you know, if they Good feel, them. if it's part of what they want yeah, to do, absolutely. then you'll do it. And if you don't, I listen, you know. I'd say I, it'll all, I can already see the text messages that are be flying in flying already in. on yeah, this. Yeah. Listen, the Ashley Fitzgibbon, um, best of luck taking the elimination communication on tour. Thank and, you. Uh, around, if people around are looking Europe for you, the videos, the podcast, where can they find you? Yeah, so my website is ashingfitzgibbon.com. We have all that listed there, and they can reach out to me if they have any questions. I've already had mums come on to me and are interested in trying already. So Great. No yeah. doubt. AshingFitzGibbon.com. It's all there. Thank you so much for Thanks chatting to us. Have a great thank time you, on tour. Ashen. I will, thank you. Uh, coming up next, our resident GP is going to be answering your health questions. Plus, so Derek is chatting to Leitrim Hurler. Zach Moradi, are they doing a hurling challenge on a boat? We don't know what's going to happen. We'll talk to you very shortly. Hey, very welcome back. I'm reading a message here about uh, the potty training and stuff as well. Lots of texts coming in. A few people in the have tried training. it, yeah. So this is um, elimination. So trying to potty your chain your child from, from birth. To, yeah, I was. I saw the video of her with the child so young and trying to mm. sit the child on the potty and stuff like that. Yeah, is the child aware of that? No, but if you Not learn, that it's how you learn from the start. Yeah, you know, you just do different things. Anyway, thank you, Trevor. Signals. I'm sure we'll do something about it again because there's been a big response to it, and we'll chat to it in a while. But uh, all morning we were asking you. This is something else about children. This is a, is it right to share pictures of children on social media? And we've got some poll results for you. Uh, well, we can reveal that the majority of you at home, 87% feel that it is not appropriate. 13% think that it is appropriate. But it's amazing, though, if you look online, the amount of influencers and people with massive numbers who regularly put their pictures... I mean, listen, children, it's, a, it's a conversation in our house that I'm being told I'm not allowed to do it anymore. Because, what? because oh yeah, you did have pictures I get of. That. Yeah. I don't do it very often. No, that's the thing. No, yeah. So I don't think. But if Emma could... was dressed up or something like that, going yeah. to a party and she that's had a little. That's because he was dressed as Prince yeah. Charming. It's yeah. kind of it's like it's a family moment. I kind of think it's like you see the, the whole thing was it's role playing, isn't it? That people then set up individual accounts for children and pretend that they're mm. theirs, and then there's this whole direct messaging. Thing because you put that picture out there of Emma then somebody else could t take that picture and use it yeah. somewhere else. Yeah. And it can always be used in the papers and used yeah. for whatever yeah. else. Yeah. And what uh, I think it was Anne was in to talk about as well, she's a journalist who decided to take her kids off. Her eight-year-old said to her, I don't want pictures to be out there of me, of things that I, I don't, don't remember, remember doing. Oh, well, this is well, that's there, true, uh, yeah. Some um, opinions on this. Emma says, this is why I don't post photos of my children on social media. Friends thought that I was odd. My children can post pictures when they're older. My job is to protect them. There are too mm. many weirdos out there, yeah. is what Emma says. And um, Nikki says the same. People overshare the pictures. The kids probably don't want their pictures online. Once it's online, it can go anywhere, and it's very unfair on the child. Yeah, uh, Margaret, I only ever share pictures of my 11-month-old to my carefully curated close friends list. And I think that's what Elaine was saying, that go through your friends yeah. list, be careful, because even if your account is private, yeah. 
uh, you might not know there's accounts get hacked, accounts get changed, and that somebody else can take that picture. They could be in a close friend list, and then they could share then it. Your then your friend might share that to somebody else who's not then, in that close list, then and then it's it goes, gone. it's gone as well. So, you see, uh, once it's on Facebook and Instagram, really, it is public mm. property. Thank you so much to everyone uh, who got involved today. Now, Derek. Derek, Derek, Derek. He's on the beautiful River Shannon. He's stuck. Uh, he's got company and we, we think, are you stuck on the River Shannon, Derek? <laughs> I am, <laughs> look, you couldn't ask for a better place to be on a Thursday morning, guys. Welcome down here to Carrigan Shan, the beautiful Carrigan Shan in County Leitrim. I'm with my new bestie, <laughs> Zach Morani. How are you, Zach? All right, Eric. Good to see you, buddy. Welcome to Leitrim. Yeah. I believe this is your first time here. Well, first time here, first time here broadcasting. You're, so in, it's you're great. in Marbella of Ireland. <laughs> I'm, I'm Ireland. Now, yeah. uh, take us back to, um, uh, you're originally from uh, Kurdistan, born in Iraq. Yeah, so I've been living in Ireland 20 years now. First, I arrived in Carrick and Shannon on the 1st of July 2002, so nearly 20 years. So your family were caught in the middle of the Gulf War at the time? That's right, yeah, and that Gulf War went on for 38 days. Okay. So I was born 16th of January 1991. And there was bombs going off left, right and centre around Left and right and centre, yeah. Wow. And yeah. the family decided to pack up and move to Ireland? Pack up and move to Ireland. We came here as a... Uh, political programme refugee okay. in 2002 and Ireland has changed since since 2002 as well so it's Ireland is very multicultural as you see the whole country has changed whether we like it or not it's going to change and, yeah. and the world is changing in general as now, well. Now let's talk about your love of hurling because you picked up the sport when you were a young lad. Yeah so it all started in Lovely Leitrim. Yeah. Started all in Carrick and Shannon, just around the corner here. In St Mary's. In St Mary's, yeah, mm. primary school. So I started playing hurling and football with St Mary's, Carrick. So, so that's why the book is called Life Begins in Leitrim. Yeah, and you do have a, you you do have a book out actually, and and the book is doing really well for you. But in, in terms of uh, your your hurling, then you went on, and you also you're also in in Dublin as well. So you're between Dublin and Leitrim at the moment, aren't you? I'm between the two. They call me a dolce in Dublin, <laughs> so I'm, I'm half and half. Okay, you're half and half, and you're you're playing up there, and you're coaching up there in Dublin as well in Talla. That's right. I'm playing with Thomas Davis, uh, GA club in Talla for the last 18 years. So. And you won Talla Person of the Year. A big shout out to everyone watching in Talla. Hello, everybody in Talla. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and there, of course, then your love of hurling has has developed, and of course, uh, G the GAA is changing as well. You said the face of the GAA is changing, isn't it? Yeah. In general, the sport uh, the face of sport in Ireland is changing and I mean the country is becoming very multicultural as you see in everywhere every county and you see the face of the soccer in Ireland is changing the rugby is changing the GA is also changing it's going to take a little bit of time we're Leitrim yeah. at the moment by the way Leitrim yeah. um, we're surviving <laughs> you're <laughs> but you're getting ready for the new season ahead yeah right? we're getting ready for the new season ready, but one thing ready. about Carrick and Shannon here you know you see all the hundreds of boats lying mm. up here but it's a great place to come for hens and stag. As you oh, see, there's about yeah. 80 to 100 hens and stags going on every week here. Yes, if you're looking for a, a good night out. If you're looking, yeah, if you're looking <laughs> for a boyfriend or a girlfriend, <laughs> Carrie and Shannon is the place to be. He's single, by the way, if anyone's asking. Right. OK, I believe we have a little bit of a hurling challenge, right? So uh, the challenge here this morning is to get as many hops on the hurley as we can, right? Or yeah. hurl, as you say, right? OK, yeah. so I believe we have a clock back in studio. Tell me a word. Are you with me now on this one? Yes, so we're, we're just... So we're on the boat now with, a, with a former leader hurler. <laughs> OK, uh, right. Oh. Derek, three, two, one, go. Two, one, let's go. Right, one, two, three, four, five. You're holding six, the horn eight, wrong, and you're from Limerick. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, 48, 49, 50, 51, 52, 53, 54, 55, 56, 57, 58, 59, 60, 61, 62, 63, 64, 65, 66, 67, 68, 69, 70, 71, 72, 73, 74, 75, 76, 77, <laughs> there we have it, Zach. Thank you so much for chatting to us here this morning. No problem. Best of luck with the hurling. You're a great representative for the GA as well. Yes, oh, guys, we nearly had it. Sorry about that. <laughs> you know, it's live TV. Of... We made a mess, but anyway, that's live <laughs> Looks TV. like Back you're you enjoying yourself in a stag do in Carrick and Shannon <laughs> last night. The old coordination's off. That's exactly it. I actually, with it being Derek, I was like, he's just going to hop right in after that. Oh, probably. Well, I think he was meant to take off, but the boat's broken down. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, coming up next, Dr. Monica will be here to answer your health-related questions. We'll see you back here very soon.
Welcome back to Ireland AM. You've been sending us in your most pressing health questions for Dr. Monica perez -Oykay. Yeah, So, Monica, let's get straight to them. And Mary's okay. our first um, message here. I've had a Ventolin inhaler for nearly two years. Would it still be safe to use? I'm imagining not if it's two years old. Uh, no. Um, so, it is recommended not to use one inhaler for more than a year. And the question is also, why do you have the Ventolin inhaler? Was it meant to be for a short term? Why is he like an underlying asthma or things like that? So she should definitely get reviewed by a doctor and see if she actually needs an inhaler. Okay. And a, definitely a newer one. Right. Definitely a newer one. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Is that because of the efficacy? Can it? Yes, it does reduce after. It does reduce after a yeah. while. Because yeah. I'm always looking at the best before going, nah, it's fine for ages. Yeah. Right. I suppose, yeah, like it might still be effective, but if you do need an inhaler, then you should get a new one after a year. Yeah. Okay. Um, ben says, I recently started to develop a white tongue. What does that mean? A white tongue. So there are so many reasons why you could have a white tongue. Now, what do you mean a white yeah. tongue? Is this like little things, like the little spores bubbles? Or whatever. One, yeah. yeah, so um, the medical term for that would be leukoplakia. So you could have white patches on your tongue or you could have a white coated tongue, which could happen in the case of like thrush. So, you know, when you have that quarter tongue burning sometimes, so that could be oral thrush and you could need uh, just drops or even like oral uh, antifungal medication and that could help with it. Now, if um, he was a smoker and is gradually developing this, then you'd have to wonder, could there be an underlying malignancy or something like that? So you should get that checked out. The other reason is you could also get a white tongue. It could be um, maybe you're deficient in iron or B12. So my response to him is, if he is concerned about the tongue, then he should get reviewed by his GP. But if it is oral thrush, then it should be, because that obviously can be passed on. It can, uh, because it's an antifungal, but uh, it's very common. So people could actually even develop that after a course of antibiotics. So it's not something that, I, oh my God. No, oh, yeah, don't forget. Yeah, 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 it needs to be treated. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Yeah. Even babies get this as well. So would, it yes. would it make your taste different? Would it give you a smelly breath? Like, does it do anything like that? It would, to make it odd, to have an odd sensation. Okay. Yeah. Mm. Right. Okay. Um, I'm constantly getting stomach cramps. This is Jade. I'm constantly getting stomach cramps and I have very loose bowel movements. Could this be irritable bowel syndrome? When it comes to your bowels, um, so um, if there has been a change in your bowels, then that's something critical. If it's something that is, she's always been like that, then it could be a irritable bowel syndrome. It could also be related to what she's eating. So does she maybe have a lot of gluten in her diet? Some people, if they maybe change the diet, it could upset their tummy. So my response to her herself is, if it's something that is new, so a change in your bowel movement mm -hmm. should be something that should be reviewed by a doctor because it could be um, a red flag for bowel cancer. Oh, really? Yeah. So but it is something, that, something that's new. And if yes. You, so if you haven't changed your diet yeah. and it's new, yeah, get yeah. to a doctor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whereas for other people, you know, when you do change your diet, yeah. that messes, that can mess it does with your mess whole and, system. Yeah, even with some medications. Sometimes if you go on antibiotics, it could cause like a loose bowel motion. If you start maybe a medication for diabetes, something like metformin, for a while it could cause loose bowel motions as well. So if it's something that you've always had the same diet, nothing new, and then all of a sudden my bowels uh, have changed, okay. then you definitely... Like you could have a little virus or something like that if it's you only for have... a few days. Exactly. But I mean, if this is going on mm. for a long time, exactly. but if it's for a few days and then it starts to clear yeah. up, yeah, then so that's you... a bug, like could yeah, be a little bug virus. or something. Yeah, there. yeah. Okay. we were we were talking about this because the old wives' tale in Ireland was to lash a, 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 tea bag. a, a wet tea bag on it. So this is from Carla. I've woken up this morning with a sty on my eye. What's the best way to treat it? Tea bag, Carla. We don't even have to go to Monica. Let's I move immediately, on. I'm I'm, I'm I joking. immediately said a tea bag. You did, yeah. We always do that. Well, so uh, the tea bag uh, theory, uh, I wouldn't. You're not, uh, you're not impressed. You're not impressed. Monica's like, what was your grandmother doing to you? It probably could help. There is some, maybe some part of history to that. What I would recommend for Carla is that um, so cool boiled water, a clean piece of cotton, and then just cool. So the compress. So if you do that for about 10 minutes, so we just kind of compress it. So a sty could be just maybe a blocked vessel, a block uh, block there. So with the heat there, you kind of make it a bit softer. Okay. And that could help it. After a couple of days, maybe two to three days, if it's not improving, you can get over-the-counter ointments from your pharmacist as well. And obviously, if it's something that's quite severe and um, causing a lot of pain, your GP could give you antibiotic drops. You could also be on antibiotic tablets. And then if it's something that is recurrent, you could actually have um, surgery for it. 
Oh, oh need, yeah, if it's surgery. concurrent. Yeah. But if she's just woken up this morning, I think yeah. a lot of people just kind of wake up. Yeah, with it. Yeah. Hot water. Yes. But let the water go cool. Yeah, cool, yeah, cool, yeah. cool. Boil, boil, yeah. boil, boil water, the water, boil. let yes. it go no, cool. Yeah. A bit of a, a cotton yeah. bud, a clean cotton bud. Yes. So the tea bag. See, I, a, a cool, a, after you've made your cup of tea, take the tea bag out and rest it on your stye. Now, I don't know. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> don't take our advice. Don't take our advice. Monica went to college for this. <laughs> to listen, college. listen, she went to Trinity. Listen to the tr I <laughs> Trinity people always have to say, they didn't just go to college, yeah, they we went, went to, to Trinity. Trinity. <laughs> you have to let everyone know you went to, I love that. Oh, God. Cork and Trinity in the two things. That's amazing. Um, Jessica, I've suffered with hemorrhoids since giving birth to my last child five years ago. What's the best option for me to get rid of them once and for all? Jessica, you poor thing. Oh, poor thing, really. Uh, so hemorrhoids, uh, pregnancy, you could have that after a vaginal delivery because of the pressure. Yeah. And there are surgeries that could uh, you could have if it's something that's been persistent for over five years. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, so that would be the best course for herself. There are ointments as well. And then she has to kind of see a diet. Is she constipated? If you're constantly constipated, you're putting a lot of pressure down there. So that could also oh, be... Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah. You poor thing. Not only is she on TikTok, on Instagram, lives in Cork. <laughs> Trinity College Medical Degree, everybody. <laughs> Dr. Monica Perez, okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Much. And a super skirt as yeah, well, Monica. Exactly. Thank you for having me. Did you do it back on your style? Coming up on Tomorrow's <laughs> Island AM, it's Friday the 3rd. And we're going to find out if it's really the unluckiest day of the year. <laughs> Lots <Okay>. more. <laughs> Join the team tomorrow. Bye-bye. <laughs>